Good afternoon. I, I hope everybody was able to get some lunch and have a break, um, get, get through some important emails, um, obviously including the one that you uh, used to sign in. So uh, we have worked on a couple of issues and it looks like people are signing in uh, rapidly. So hopefully those issues um, will be resolved with this new link. Um, so uh, just uh, give us a couple more minutes to let some more folks in. Um, it's one o'clock right now, and at 101, um, I'll give us 30 more seconds and then start uh, into this session. Thank you. If you're uh, just popping in, we're going to wait about 30 more seconds to allow as many folks that are trying to get into this uh, summit session, and then uh, we'll start promptly around 1.02. All right. Um, it looks like we have a quorum and, and hopefully a few more will be uh, coming along shortly. But uh, I know everybody's uh, very busy and, and set aside time for this uh, very important summit for Kentucky River Ports uh, Highways and Rail Freight Study. And I uh, just want to thank you again for joining us. Um, your thoughts, your, um, your input, and your involvement in this study is, is just very, very important to making it successful, making sure that uh, each of the stakeholders um, gets a, a voice and also has an, a, a chance to share their ideas on how to, to best uh, um, leverage economic development strategies uh, for the Kentucky River Port and Freight Network. So um, that being said, I would like to uh, to kind of give you just a real quick run through on Zoom. Um, I think we all need a few extra Zoom tips, obviously. Uh, it seems to, be a, seems to be a moving target, but uh, we're working hard to make sure that this is a successful uh, session as well. And uh, the uh, upper right corner, you can change your view and you can switch around things so that you can see the speakers, see the chat box and uh, see the participants that are signed in. Um, if you would uh, use the bottom bar to mute yourself. And if you haven't muted yourself yet, uh, please take the time to do that now just so that there's no unwanted background noise. Also, if you are going to ask a question, um, you use the camera. Just, it helps us see who's talking and, um, and uh, to see what uh, you know, you're saying. Sometimes if you're talking and you're on mute, we can tell that. <laughs> and uh, that way we make sure we get, get to you. Also, um, use the chat function while the speakers are presenting. Uh, we welcome you to go ahead and type your questions into the chat then. Um, that way we can kind of be prepared to ask those questions to the speakers uh, following their presentations. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's reactions for uh, things you, you really like to hear um, or maybe didn't like to hear. <laughs> uh, you can use your reactions emojis to uh, to add to that. And there's also some more functions if you want to play around with them, as long as it doesn't say in this session, then you should be safe. Um, so that all those things, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to to Haley uh, by email and, um, and and hopefully she can help you out. Um, so we are in the second session of the one o'clock to 145. It's, the, it's titled the 2021 Changes in Federal Transportation and Trade Policies. Um, this is a session that will be uh, 
presented to you by both uh, Deb Calhoun and Tim uh, Pickering. And I'd like to go ahead and, and uh, just give a, a brief introduction to both of them. Um, Deb Calhoun is the Senior Vice President of the Waterways Council, or some people know it as WCI. Um, it is a national public policy organization, and they advocate for a modern and well-maintained system of inland waterways and ports. Um, she has worked with WCI since uh, 2003 and um, has developed the communications program uh, of its predecessor organization, uh, the Water Waterways Work. Uh, Ms. Calhoun also served as the Secretary of National Waterways Foundation, whose mission is to develop um, the intellectual um, marine highway routes and projects as well. Uh, the I'm sorry, the intellectual uh, foundation whose mission it is to develop uh, factual uh, arguments for the uh, efficient and well-funded and secure inland waterway system. So without uh, any further uh, ado, I'd like to uh, welcome um, Deb Calhoun and I'm bringing up her presentation right now. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, I just want to thank uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be part of this panel. I uh, always appreciate the chance to talk about our work and, and the funding that we advocate for to modernize the inland waterway system. I actually live in Paducah now, so I am a legit Kentucky voice on these, these issues, um, the critical important, importance of the inland waterways. Next slide. So just a quick note on who WCI is. We are um, the National Public Policy Organization. Uh, we're based here in Washington, DC. I'm actually in the Washington office this week. Uh, we do advocate for a modern, well-maintained, efficient lock and dam system. Uh, we actually represent a unique coalition of, of members and voices, uh, towboat operators, shippers of energy construction, manufacturing inputs, ag, agriculture and other commodities and materials. Uh, we also have a, an organized labor contingent. They subcontract to the Corps of Engineers to build out the, the lock and dam system, the projects on the system uh, and conservation organizations. We also represent ports and other advocacy groups. Um, and so um, I think that that gives us a, a real unique perspective. Anybody that, that is dependent upon um, you know, a modern, efficient, reliable system is generally a, me um, a member of WCI. Next slide. I'm not gonna read this next slide to you, but this is really just a snapshot of, um, of where we are on the inland waterway system. Uh, you know, our geographic, economical, and, and um, economic and societal impacts, um, you know, a 12,000 mi navigable mile uh, span that touches 38 states or an economic generator in terms of jobs, removing uh, lots of key commodities and in the most uh, safe and energy efficient way. Next slide. I just wanna uh, point out that uh, waterways do benefit the entire nation. It's not just for commercial navigation. Um, there are the beneficiaries noted there, those stable pools of water that are created by the lock and dam system, not only uh, facilitate navigation and, and provide a, um, you know, a conduit to US competitiveness, but it does uh, also have a, a multitude of beneficiaries for flood control, uh, all the recreational, recreational opportunities we have on the inland waterway system, industrial and municipal uh, water supply, national security is one as well. Um, and so this is an important slide to remember when I talk about the, the funding uh, of construction and major rehab on the system, which we're gonna to touch on in just a minute. Next slide. So um, this is just a, you know, sort of a look at uh, pieces of the pie um, of, of what we call America's building block commodities. Um, the, the variety and, and high value cargoes of what we're moving on the inland system. Um, this really is the most cost competitive, safest, greenest way to move it. Um, nearly 515 million tons valued at about $134 billion. This is a transportation option. Of course, we're in an intermodal society, but the inland waterways are so key to, um, to moving these bulk commodities for use domestically and for export. Next slide. 
So since so school's back in session in some places and uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASTE just released uh, in early March, its infrastructure report card, uh, it evaluated 17 categories of infrastructure and waterways, locks and dams were, were two of those categories. Um, they looked at in, in the waterways separately, locks separately from dams, I should say. Um, the nation's overall infrastructure received a C minus um, and the in the waterways sector, our grade was raised um, ever slightly to a D plus from 2017's D grade and we had a low grade of D minus in 2013. That was one of the lowest grades for all sectors of that year of the report card. So um, certainly not gonna get us into the best schools with a D plus, but um, that, that plus did reflect um, the reversal of some you know, chronic underinvestment in the inland waterways, um, really a more purposeful and efficient uh, planning process by the Corps of Engineers, um, a 2014 increase in the diesel fuel tax uh, that operators pay, and I will talk, talk a little bit further about that in a minute, um, and higher operations and maintenance funding that has resulted in um, fewer uh, unscheduled emergency outages on the system at locks. Um, they also noted, ASCE also noted, noted in their grade for inland waterways, the number of stakeholders that support and depend upon a reliable inland waterways transportation system, and particularly the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, they did a study, which we'll talk about um, as well. Uh, and I cut that slide just to save a little bit of time. USDA did a study uh, back in 2019 that um, was titled The Importance of um, the U.S. Inland Waterways to U.S. Agriculture. And so that pretty much says, says it all, uh, how our American family farmers really rely upon the capacity and the conduit to competition for moving um, agri imports upriver and then getting finished product down to the export market, allowing them to stay as, as competitive as they can against our South American uh, competitors in soybeans and, and um, you know, all the other grain products that are moving. Uh, ASCE also estimated that there's a $2.59 trillion gap in investment in U.S. infrastructure. So um, while we're talking about inland waterways, uh, you know, overall, we need to do better in this country for, uh, for infrastructure. Next slide. So here's kind of where uh, our bad grades come from, I guess. Um, we actually see it here at WCI as a great opportunity to raise that grade from a D plus to something uh, a lot better. Um, additional in investment in lock and dam infrastructure is needed. As you can see here, there's really just one lock, the Olmstead Lock and Dam project on the Ohio River that opened in 2018 after a nearly 40 year construction period that is less than nine years old. So that's the newest one on the system with the majority of locks um, hovering around 80 years. And the average age of those locks is actually 50 to 60 years. And um, so the majority are um, you know, past their economic uh, design life. So we really focus on this and trying to bring those priority projects online and returning those transportation cost benefits to the nation. Next slide. Uh, these next slides are going to show more of a sort of good news uh, picture, if you will. Um, I said earlier I was going to just discuss um, how the, the system is funded, and we talked about those national beneficiaries. Um, until a policy change uh, that occurred at the end of December in a WERDA bill, the Water Resources Development Act, that I'll talk about in a minute, um, commercial operators using this system paid 50% of the cost of uh, new lot construction and major rehabilitation on the system, and that was through a dedicated 29 cent per gallon diesel fuel tax that is deposited into an inland waterways trust fund uh, and then matched with general treasury revenues to cover the other half. Uh, again, that's a recognition that, uh, that there are those other national beneficiaries, that's where the, the other revenues come into play, but we are the only user and beneficiary of the system that pays for half of the cost of new locks and major rehab. Um, and we pay the, the highest surface tax among the other modes. Um, we had uh, this cost share agreement with the government and um, back in 2014, we actually lobbied Congress to be able to raise the amount of diesel fuel tax that we were paying from 20 cents a gallon to 29 cents per gallon into that trust fund. Um, that's a 45% increase. So certainly not insignificant. 
Um, we did it because we knew that the more investment was needed uh, for this infrastructure, and we knew we had an agreement that the government would, would kick in the other half. And so in the past, we only could fund that one Olmstead Lock and Dam project, uh, but now through that diesel fuel tax and increased investment and some other policy changes, uh, we are seeing funding now, full and efficient funding for the Corps for about four to five priority navigation projects, plus um, some PED funding to get other projects sort of ready for construction. Um, this, as you can see, the blue line is the president's budget request, always kind of a low ball request. Um, and then the red line is the actual appropriated amount of money. Um, that's kind of where WCI, you know, gets involved with our champions on co in Congress to raise the amount of money so that the Corps does have at least uh, full and efficient funding, if not more, uh, of um, annual appropriations to do their work. You'll notice in FY21, the request from the uh, Trump administration at that time was zero for construction. Now, this is really not necessarily a Trump administration view or you know, a Biden administration view for FY22. When that request comes out, uh, it's more of an office of management and budget, but essentially they requested $0 uh, to fund um, lock and dam for construction. But in the end, $323 million was appropriated from co Congress for um, in the Waterways Trust Fund projects. Um, so you know, the, we, we never wanna see a zero request. We wanna see um, you know, full and efficient funding for the core. Uh, the FY22 request has not yet come out, so we don't have that yet. Next slide. This next uh, slide will show you the, the annual funding for the core civil works mission. So this is not mili military construction. This is all the work related to uh, their, their inland waterways and their mission areas like navigation as a key one, ecosystem restoration, flood control, um, et cetera. And so this again shows the, the request from Congress or from the president administration in blue all the way back to fiscal year 10, all the way up to FY21, pretty flat line. And then it did jump up a little bit um, but as you can see, the the climb all the way from you know um, what was requested back in um, in fiscal 10, 5.13 billion um, by Congress or by the President rather, all the way up uh, to uh, 5.45, and then all the way up in FY21 to 7.8 billion dollars for the Corps to be able to accomplish their um, their their mission. So, you know, that's a that's a really big uh, increase and that's that's what we need to see and, and have continue. Next slide. Operations and maintenance. This is the amount of money that um, and the funding that's paid 100% by the federal government to maintain our harbors and our channels. You know, if you have uh, perfectly modern locks and dams or infrastructure, it doesn't matter at all if you have silted in channels from high water, high water or low water. Um, so this is the amount of money that um, maintains the system. Uh, this has actually been a great news story. Um, you know, O&M funding from FY 2008 to FY21, you can see really um, you know, a steady climb there and there've been historic requests and a historic amount uh, appropriated uh, over, over the fiscal year. And so the red line again is what we're, we're focused on and a steady climb there. Next uh, slide. And so this is kind of the oh, one, one back. Whoops, did I do that? There you go. Um, this is kind of the proof of those numbers. Um, Healthy O&M numbers will result in uh, fewer unscheduled emergency outages on the system. And so as you can see, that's been going down significantly. You'll note that 2019 showed the slightest number of unscheduled outage hours since 2005. So this is, you know, we're, we're putting our money uh, for the core and where it needs to go. And, and they've done a tremendous job under, under great duress. And, and so the proof is really in the pudding and this is much appreciated. Next slide. Um, so I wanted just to touch upon, um, as I mentioned, there was a, um, a cost share change um, in the Water Resources Development Act. That's our policy bill for, for um, this space. It happens every two years. We want it to happen every two years. There was a period where it went from 2007 to 2014, but we've been on a biennial schedule uh, since 14. And so that's, that's um, a great great thing and great progress in itself. Um, this is where we can make real uh, policy changes for the inland waterways. Um, so in addition to annual appropriations, this is where we're seeking, um, you know, these, these, um, these uh, 
authorized changes. Um, so we uh, asked to adjust the cost share that was in play from 50% coming from commercial operators through that diesel fuel tax and 50% through general treasury uh, to make a change to 65% from the general treasury and 35% from commercial operators. This being done for a number of reasons and our request uh, done for uh, a number of reasons. One, I mentioned the Olmstead project that took you know 40 years to, um, to build it was authorized in 1988 at a cost of $775 million, of which operators paid half um, and ballooned up to uh, you know, go from a seven-year construction period to 40 years and uh, ballooned up to $3.2 billion. And so again, um, operators were funding half of the cost of that. So in our lifetime, in our grandkids' lifetimes, we would never see meaningful uh, modernization occur on the inland waterways if we didn't make a change. So back in the word of bill of 14, they changed the cost share at Olmsted to 85% federal funding and 15% from the trust fund that matched with the diesel fuel tax increase that we advocated for immediately helped to bring um, you know, more money and more investment flowing into the system. Olmstead came online four years ahead of schedule and even saved um, you know, some uh, millions of dollars from its post authorized um, cost uh, report. And so um, you know, when we see these cost share adjustments, um, we, we see more efficiency being injected into the system. There was a lot of support for this as well, because back in Warna 2016, a similar cost share of 7525 was made to the deep draft navigation sector to allow for um, expedited dredging to make sure that those post Panama Max ships could ply our waters. So there was already precedence for doing this. Um, in the end, we were able to achieve a cost share change now of 6535, which will, um, again, uh, inject quite a lot of um, of additional investment. In fact, uh, $1 billion in additional investment for lock construction over uh, a 10 year period. So um, we'll be able to complete more projects, get them off the books and delivering those, those cost year benefits to the nation. So we're very proud of, of our work with WARDA. Um, next slide. Um, infrastructure, you know, this is infrastructure week, um, and we think it is going to be infrastructure week, not W-E-A-K, but W-E-E-K. Um, we will fit perfectly into an infrastructure uh, bill. We don't know what that's going to look like. We don't yet know how it's going to be funded, but we do feel a lot more momentum uh, for, for an actual stimulus bill to, to focus on infrastructure. Um, and we're just waiting for those, for those details to be released. These are, are our priority projects. Projects. Uh, the two at the top will come online in about FY23, FY25. Chickamauga and Kentucky on the Tennessee River, both in Tennessee and Kentucky. The others have received head funding um, to move toward construction. So there were some really important um, you know, geographic locations for modernization on the system. Um, this this um, infrastructure bill is going to have a uh, climate change focus and environmental focus. We think we fit in perfectly within that because waterborne and transportation commerce commerce is really the most fuel efficient traffic congestion relieving environmentally friendly mode among all surface modes and so um you know even the rail and trucking industry cannot deny that so we're at the top of the list for that and so we think that um we can put people back to to work on these um get them built get them delivering um all those uh, transportation benefits and um allowing us to compete even more stringently in a tightening world marketplace and um infrastructure is the way to go um and i think that's my last slide we can switch to the next one here's my uh contact information i know i went through that fairly quickly but um want to leave time for questions and for the the next speaker so thank you so much really appreciate the opportunity thank you uh deb there was a couple questions um um maybe we'll hold them to the end if you can stay on with us and we'll yes ask them all together Yes, um, that way great. I can make sure that, that Tim's able to get through uh, the, the bulk of his presentation and then we'll do questions. So thank you very much. Um, that was was very good. And if you see on the screen, um, Deborah's contact information is right there. And um, if you're not able to capture it at the moment, then uh, just, just get a hold of one of the team leads and we'll make sure to get you in touch with her and, and, and uh, to be able to get this good information. So, um, and we'll ask questions of her in just a minute, but. Uh, with no further ado, um, 
Tim Pickering um, has led the Marine Highway Program since 2015. Um, his three-person team uh, manages the designation of Marine Highway routes and projects, as well as uh, the Marine Highway Grant Program. Um, there at. So, um, Tim, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share the Kentucky River Ports and all the stakeholders on this project. So I'll go ahead and, and let you uh, get started and I'll, I'll switch the slides when you let me know. Okay, uh, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, Deb, that was very informative, thank you. And I'm glad to see you escape from uh, the uh, orbit of DC, IMDU. Um, next slide, please. So, um, you know, this is, I, I've truncated this, this presentation quite a bit, and you've probably seen some of these slides in the past, but, you know, this is the, the, the answer to why marine highways is, is kind of self-evident just by this um, right here. It shows uh, the economies of scale, uh, one barge, 15 barge tow moving a thousand tractor trailers. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've not quite gotten a, a string that large yet, but we've had, uh, I know um, five to 600 uh, moving at least uh, on several occasions on the Mississippi. So um, we are, uh, we're just getting uh, these services off the ground and uh, hopefully we'll see more of these in the future. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so for those of you who are familiar with the program, it's a, it's a three-step program. First is um, the route designations and, and you know, the, the Ohio is the M70 and the, the routes are de are numbered in accordance with the the interstate that they roughly parallel. Um, so uh, then you can get a project designation, uh, which is a, a service uh, along the Marine Highway route, and those are designated by the secretary. And then once you have that designation, it makes you eligible for uh, the Marine Highway uh, Grant Program. Uh, so next slide, we'll go into this a little more. So you'll see the map here that. Um, shows the, uh, the current uh, system. We have just added, uh, one of my goals was to get the territories uh, into this. So we have added uh, American Samoa and the US Virgin Islands in the last year. And we uh, have a package right now for um, uh, Guam and the Northern Marianas uh, that uh, the secretary will hopefully be approving uh, sometime next month, along with some new uh, designations. Uh, next slide. So to be eligible, uh, a state government agency, uh, local governments, port authorities, tribal governments, I've not had one of those yet, but we are in discussions with a couple of uh, tribal governments uh, uh, in uh, Pacific Northwest and Alaska, and uh, metropolitan planning organizations. Uh, and the purpose of the designation is to create a new or expand an existing marine highway service. So we do get conceptual services and um, We've, uh, we've had a few of those have, have become very successful. Uh, we have a few that, that have not, and they're still in the planning phase. Uh, the, purpose of, the other purpose of designation is to realize public benefits. That's the reason the program was founded under the Clean, uh, Clean Energy Act. Um, so we can measure the truck miles that have been removed uh, from the highways. And um, then using uh, calculators that are available, uh, we can um, determine reduced road maintenance, uh, reduced CO2 emissions, um, reduced congestion, reduced fatalities, um, all those sorts of things. And, and we're able to, to show the benefits of, the, of this relatively small grant. Uh, I think it's punching above its weight as far as, as what uh, uh, the results have been. Uh, and then uh, you receive recognition from the secretary, which is a nice signed certificate. And um, so next slide. So the, uh, to, be a, to get a project designation, uh, you must use US documented vessels, uh, 46 USC 121. There's, uh, we had always in, uh, had this, it, when, we first, uh, when I first arrived here, uh, the legislation was not that specific. It just said uh, US documented vessels, we, which we took to mean Jones Act vessels. But now that we're dealing with uh, the uh, territories, uh, some of them do not have a, uh, a full Jones Act requirement, they have a, a US flag requirement. And that's what that says. It's basically, you have to be uh, documented for the trade lanes that you're operating in. 
uh, must be loaded or unloaded at a U.S. port or a Canadian port within the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway system, which is our, our one allowance. And essentially, we can handle all kinds of freight except pure bulk products. And um, we have a legislative change request in for that, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, next slide. And that brings us to the federal support. Uh, so um, the eligible applicants are the, um, the original applicant for the, for the designated project or the private entity that they're working with, with the approval. So we, we get a letter that says they are authorized um, to apply under this, uh, under this designation. And we've had several uh, uh, tug companies um, that have uh, had barges uh, and tugs built uh, with these funds. Uh, and what they can be used for is, uh, this is exactly from the, the word, word for word from the legislation, the development expansion of port and landside infrastructure, which typically means cargo handling equipment, and the purchase and the development expansion of documented vessels, uh, which um, I have to change that language. <laughs> As I just said, it's not just Jones Act, uh, modification of uh, vessels or barges. And um, uh, we've, um, we can also do planning efforts, but we have to be, uh, you have to have a market, you have to prove a market during the designation phase. So during the grant phase, you can't ask for a market study, uh, but we can do design efforts. So if you need to, uh, to modify a barge and you need a naval architect or something like that uh, to draw up some plans, that's an allowable um, uh, grant. Next slide, please. Um, and um, so this is the, uh, uh, the, you get um, credibility of concept, the um, uh, DOT support. Uh, we will, because we, we have, we do talk about these, your uh, projects at different conferences and such. Uh, a clearinghouse of lessons learned. We have, we've had a couple of, uh, we had an epic failure <laughs> that happened in California. And uh, we use that uh, as a learning tool. So um, uh, the, the new uh, final rule, which was, um, published in 2018, uh, as well as um, uh, the, um, uh, we've had subsequent, uh, the AAPA um, and uh, Merritt had a port planning investment toolkit, did a marine highway module, and all those lessons learned are, are, are in there. So um, we also promote and develop partnerships. We have a lot of companies that will call us up and say, we have a good idea, but we don't have any, um, uh, contacts uh, with uh, with a government agency, and our gateway directors uh, are very helpful at connecting uh, up. Uh, so we have ten gateway directors around the country. You have one in in Paducah, um, and uh, we've also been successful in linking uh, coast wide services to international services. <clears throat> uh, next slide. So this shows the uh, where the grant money has gone. Um, it's, a, it's been a relatively small amount, uh, as I said, $5 million for a couple of years, $7 million for a couple of years. Uh, we had 9.8 uh, last year, and we have 10.8 uh, this year. Um, and that notice funding will be going out uh, soon. I've highlighted the ones that are in Kentucky, so you can see uh, uh, you guys have gotten a, about $3.5 million of the $33 million. So uh, you've been doing pretty well for the past several years. Um, Nucor, uh, the ones in, in 2020, uh, we're both in support of uh, new core steel uh, operations. Uh, and um, like I said, we have 10.8, we have $2.1 million from prior year grants that was returned unused. And so the, this year we're actually gonna be awarding about 12, uh, $12.9 million. And um, let's see, next slide, please. There we go. Yeah, so this is one of the uh, the ones that was just awarded, um, and uh, you know we we've, we're able to calculate some of the benefits. You'll see it says that they'll replace uh, 500 tractor trailers a month uh, from a 66 mile stretch of I-71, which will save about forty-two thousand dollars a year in road maintenance alone. And uh, since this is capital equipment that will last for decades, um, that uh, savings will continue to to go on for for decades as well. So. Uh, this small investment will, will pay out over a long period of time. Okay, next slide. 
So this is the staff, uh, Vince Mantero. He's uh, been with us for about two months. Uh, he's the, uh, the director. Um, I've been uh, here for about five years. Uh, Mauricio uh, came over from, uh, and Mauricio works on the project development side. So he's the guy that will, uh, if you have uh, a desire to get a project uh, through the process, uh, he's the person that will help you with that. And uh, Fred Jones, uh, who is, um, he's, he's our long, our longest term member. I think he's been with us for about seven or eight years. And uh, Fred uh, has been managing the grant program. Uh, so he gets the notice of funding prepared and, um, and we helps with the, uh, runs the evaluation process and then uh, putting the package together to go to the secretary for final approval. Okay, and he gets it, next slide. Yeah, so um, a couple of things that I, uh, I wanna talk about, I mean, I can't get ahead of the secretary, so, you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't make any announcements, but um, the, um, the notice of funding will have uh, the administration's priorities highlighted in it. So um, what form that's gonna take is still in development. Um, but uh, there's going to be a uh, an emphasis on uh, low emission, zero emission uh, equipment. Um, on um, I think you'll see an emphasis on the opportunity zones that has been in the uh, there for a couple of years. Uh, so um, that's pretty much all I can say about that. But but look for that to come out soon, and uh, I think we'll have it out mid April. Uh, the notice funding will be open for about uh, five weeks. Um, and uh, we're aiming to make awards <clears throat> sometime, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the late uh, late July timeframe. And um, with that, I think uh, just about out of time. So I'll uh, I'll pass it back and take any questions anybody has. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Um, and we will eagerly awaiting that notice and make sure that all of the stakeholders are aware of it. Um, and that's pretty good news that Kentucky's been getting close to 10% of the, the pie there with this funding opportunity. So we really should uh, continue to do, um, do our best to, to work with um, Mayor Ad to through this very uh, good program, especially uh, Lynn Waterways and, and needing such a, a great amount of money as the now. Um, so let's, uh, let's just take a look at a couple of these questions. Um, the first one, um, I believe, is for um, Deborah, and it's uh, is the Harbor Maintenance Use Trust Fund being successfully used to continue the deepening of the coastal ports in the LMR New Orleans? Uh, yes, let me can you hear me? Make yes, sure I'm not on mute. Okay, um, yes, the finally we are seeing um, some much needed efficiency being. Um, overlaid on the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Um, you know, that's a tax that's collected from companies that ship goods um, through US ports. And um, approximately $1.7 billion is collected to that fund. Um, Congress has set out, uh, beginning in WERDA back in 2014, a, a target to, to, to expend at least $1.67 a billion dollars annually to, to that fund. So, um, you know, making sure that the money goes in and then goes out for uh, for all of the dredging needs and and um, you know harbor maintenance needs that are that are needed there. Um, there's a nine billion dollar surplus uh, in 2020 in that fund, and so um, certainly, you know, that's that's a way to offset the deficit or whatever, but it's not being used and hasn't been used for its intended purpose. So um, I'm very happy to see that that's being done. And um, yes, there is funding being made available to, um, you know, to deepen the Mississippi River um, so that we can, you know, uh, reach the promise of those those larger ships coming and um, for all of the ports um, in need and all of the needs just generally. So yes, there is um, there is finally uh, work being done to make sure that uh, that that balance is being spent down for the needs that you know that it's intended for. Yeah, let me ask you a question um, related to that. What would be the best um, best way that Kentucky could leverage um, some of those funding uh, with the Army Corps? Um, would it be to to work with the Waterways Council, or would it be um, coming with projects, 
combined nature of projects um, related to the waterway infrastructure. Just just a quick thought on on you know how could the ports in Kentucky best uh, leverage this opportunity? There being um, at, at least being a surplus in in current years, it looks like. I know there's a is, is I don't know a, a surplus of appropriations versus uh, the actual uh, program, but just wanted to get your thoughts on that real quick. Yes. Uh, first of all, yes, we'd love everybody on this call to become a member of Waterways Council. <laughs> Actually, I've reached out to a number of you, um, the Kentucky ports, um, to talk to me, and we'd love to have your participation. Um, but all joking aside, I mean, I think we have a great opportunity ahead with an infrastructure bill. Um, and, you know, we, we have a $7 billion, you know, overall portfolio of projects um, across, you know, all geographies to get done. Um, and we, in a house bill, infrastructure bill last year, they allocated $3 billion uh, to the inland waterways. Now that bill didn't go all the way. So, um, you know, anywhere from three to $7 billion is what we're looking for um, in additional funding uh, through an infrastructure bill. And of course we wanna make sure that, that the funding comes in a proper way and not tolls on the on the locks or additional taxes or fees. Um, so all that is still to be determined for how they pay for it. But, um, you know, we've got a great congressional um, delegation, both in the House uh, and the Senate, uh, great support for the inland waterways and projects and for inland ports and bringing more commodities through those ports. Um, you know, that is really what Waterways Council does here in Washington, D.C. And of course, you know, throughout um, throughout the, the U.S. through stakeholders like yourselves. You know, we talk to the Corps of Engineers about what projects um, may need additional support. We talk to those champions in Congress. We talk to those authorizers about what policies make the most sense. So I think um, there is now, you know, proper funding. We're, we're not in that, you know, uh, completely woefully underfunded situation anymore for the Corps program. So we're seeing appropriations continue to rise, operations and maintenance, as I said, uh, for all of the needs of of the port, uh, ports, they're dealing with uh, the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, as I touched upon. And then we do have this, this additional opportunity through an infrastructure package. So um, I think the time is, is very, very hopeful for the inland waterways and for ports. And um, anything that I can provide you know, in terms of information or anything, please reach out to me be happy to do it. And um, as I said, I'm in Washington this week, but normally I'm in the Paducah office. So happy to, um, to talk to anybody about anything specific. Thank you, uh, Deb. I've got a question here for Tim. Um, Tim, has there been any um, discussions related to the uh, Marine Highway Program uh, that would include the uh, Mexico-U.S. Uh, Trade and Marine Highway Program? Uh, yes, um, actually, we are. Uh, we're there's an internal proposal. It hasn't. Uh, hasn't left the building yet, or hasn't left the Merad yet. Um, you know, we're still, you know, running it through the international office and the policy folks and all that. But um, uh, there is a, uh, a discussion about uh, a legislative, uh, requesting a legislative change to add both Canada and Mexico. Um, so we, we, we'd have to change the definition of, uh, our, our current definition of freight says loaded, or, you know, unloaded that are port in the United States. So that would have to change to, um, to Canada. We'd also have to, um, uh, there would probably, I imagine there'd be some caveats about how much of the grant money could leave the country. <laughs> In theory, uh, if you, if we tied up, you know, between say Mobile and Vera Cruz or something, um, they would be able to, the, the project at the, at the uh, Mexican end of the, uh, would be able to request equipment. And so, you know, we'll, that's the things that, you know, policy that we'll get into. Um, we would, uh, we're still going to require to be on, uh, U.S. documented vessel. So even though it's not in a, um, uh, it could, it, uh, you could trade it with a foreign flagship between those two ports. Normally, uh, we would require U.S. flag, um, uh, not necessarily Jones Act, but U.S. flag uh, for that trade. So you know we, we're looking through those those nuances, but uh, it is in discussion. And I have a follow up question: um, Can can and how do marine highway projects um, transcend? You know. Uh, multiple marine highway designations. Uh, so, you know, you said that Kentucky is mainly in the M70. How would they utilize other uh, or combine with other marine highways so that they uh, could? The, the, the 
projects can be between both contiguous and non-contiguous uh, marine highways. And so they do not have to touch. So you could have a project, I mean, in theory from, uh, uh, from Paducah to, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the M70 to um, um, down to New Orleans um, on the uh, M55 or um, even to the West Coast in theory. I mean, so, you know, it's on the M5. And so as long as, it, as long as the start and end points are on a marine highway, uh, there are no limitations. Okay. And this is the last question. We're, at, we're out of time, but I'd like to ask it. Um, and this is to both of y'all. Whoever would like to answer or both of you could answer. Uh, do you expect any proposal from the president's budget this year? Uh, Congress seems to be supportive regardless of what the president does, but um, does the president still need to sign a bill? Um, a bill for infrastructure or what um yeah i guess that's what they're asking is is, okay. is this a you know i know there's the um you have the the uh both the marine highway program and and the water um the water gets passed you know but um i think they were asking related to to some of the stuff you were showing up there Deb, there's the president's budget versus the um appropriation what can you just okay. explain that real quick Yes. Um, so the president's budget has not yet been released. Um, usually that comes in February's time frame. Um, but because a new administration has come just come in, we probably will see a skinny version of the budget uh, sometime in April. That'll give us just sort of the, the general overview, not specifics. And then we'll see a more detailed budget um, probably in May. Um, you know, it's, we didn't think that at the end of 20, we would get all the appropriations bills passed. And indeed, they threw them all together with the word of bill um, at the end of December and um, in a lame duck session of Congress. Um, so um, I would you know, never say never. Um, I think that's always the goal is to pass all the appropriations bills and get it done. Um, they don't want to have to have continuing resolutions and, um, and all of that in a complicated, um, already complicated environment and complicated economic environment. So um, we're hopeful that the appropriations bills will get passed. We're hopeful that they'll be uh, really before the highway bill uh, reauthorization expires at the end of September. We're hopeful that we will see an infrastructure bill get done and, and get signed into law. Lots of variables out there on that one. But, um, you know, I think from our perspective, we continue to be pretty hopeful about, about all those things. Tim, do you have any last comments or? Well, um, no, I can't obviously speak about the budget uh, without. If I get if I get in front of the secretary, I'll I'll get run over by a large bus. So uh, I won't uh, I won't go there. But um, I, I, looking at the budget, I am encouraged. Um, in the past, uh, the uh, uh, marine highways have always been zero budgets coming out of the department, and then they go. You know, they've been put in put in by Congress. Um, uh, this time, I think there will actually be a request for funding. Uh, so that's that's a positive sign. Uh, the other good sign was that uh, when uh, when Secretary Pete uh, uh, was doing his um, his tours through the various programs, all virtual, of course, um, when he came to uh, Marad, there was a lot of you know we have the federal sea lift side, which is the reserve fleets and all that, and he he was briefed by several of them, and he picked what he wanted to be briefed on, and the only program that he wanted on the on the civilian side or the, or the commercial side uh, was the Marine Highway Program. And uh, he asked several very good questions about it. And um, the uh, acting uh, administrator, the deputy uh, administrator, um, has also shown a great uh, uh, deal of interest in this. You know, we, we, they, we're known as already as the greenest um, uh, mode. And um, so uh, we've been getting a lot of attention. And uh, so I, I think this program is going to take off in the next few years. And I think that we're going to see um, budgets that that far exceed the the little amounts we've been got you know we received to date so great well that being said we're, we're uh past our allotted time we have about 10 to 11 minutes before our next session will kick off so if you uh want to stay signed in that's fine and uh just t just mute yourself turn your video off and and go get a break that's fine um we'd like to thank tim and deb for their wonderful presentations. And we appreciate you giving your time uh, today for this uh, session that kind of gives the, the, uh, the national outlook for waterways and, and the funding opportunities that are, that are coming in the near future. 
Um, so we will definitely be uh, utilizing uh, that information to better uh, position Kentucky's river ports. So again, thank you, Deborah, and, and thank you, Tim. And uh, y'all uh, go ahead and take a break and we'll see everybody back here at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hey Jim, I'm, I'm gonna have to sign off. I've got then Rebecca. It was a pleasure uh, uh, speaking here, but um, the uh, uh, the wheels of government are, are are moving quickly, and I've got a lot of things that I got to take care of here. So perfect. We really appreciate it. Oh no worries. Uh, you guys have my contact information. If you ever need me for anything else, uh, don't hesitate. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Tim. Okay, bye. I was muted when I was saying thank you. <laughs> I'm going to give you all your one minute warning. Um, it's your last bit of food and drink and, and break, and we will be back with you guys in around 2 201. Oh, look at my red line. Well, we're just going to leave that there for now. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our final session for the afternoon. Um, the uh, In this session, we were able to reach out to several of our partnering uh, states that um, are near and around um, Kentucky and, and their, their freight offices and multimodal offices to, uh, to, de to develop a panel, some brief presentations, um, and to give an opportunity to, to ask questions of uh, some of their best practices. And this was, uh, this was intended for uh, each of us to, uh, to just kind of hear what other states are doing and see uh, what may be something that could be implemented uh, within Kentucky and Kentucky River. Um, so as we get going forward, uh, just a quick reminder, the mute button is uh, down to uh, on your left. Uh, if you're not muted now, um, unless you're one of the three panelists, um, then uh, please go ahead and do that just so you don't disrupt. But after we, uh, after their short presentations and comments, we're going to open it up to both, uh, you know, questions in the chat. And uh, if you want to raise your hand, we'll, we'll let you ask a question. Uh, unmute yourself, turn on your camera, and we'll do it. We'll do a video uh, question time as well. Um, so that wrapping through that, um, we are in the, uh, the third session from two to three. It's uh, what's new in the neighborhood um, and updates from our adjacent states and their their ports and, and freight uh, programs. So uh, I'd like to introduce each of our uh, panelists. Um, I'll go one by one. Uh, first, starting with Mark Lochner. Uh, Mark is uh, with the Ohio DOT. He manages their freight maritime and logistics office um, and planning and research. Uh, he focuses on global freight movements uh, while planning to support Ohio's robust economic engine. Um, Ohio's transportation network is the fifth largest in America and uh, requires constant planning and project management uh, of strategic infrastructure. Understanding the complexities of global logistics uh, required infrastructure and new technologies that makes Ohio transportation system 
dynamic and essential. Um, at the national level, he served as the National Transportation Advisor to three U.S. Secretaries of Transportation and as a member of the MTSNAC, um, Freight Transportation Advisory Council and America's Marine Highway uh, Initiative. So um, we also have B.J. Murray. Um, B.J. Murray serves as a section chief uh, for the Illinois, D Illinois DOT uh, for the Aviation Maritime and Transportation Program. Um, Illinois has 1,095 miles of navigable waterways um, that either border or pass through the state. Um, these waterways provide the state with connections to both the Atlantic and the Atlantic Ocean and Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the Port of Chicago uh, offers terminals that handle ocean and lake vessels as well as barges um, owned by the Illinois International Port uh, District and the Lake Michigan Port is served by uh, 12 railroads and has direct access to Interstate 90, uh, 94. And uh, there are additional 18 port districts established um, by statute in, in Illinois. Uh, the state's vision for transportation is for all modes to be integrated, coordinated, planned, and built uh, with the idea that the the present and future travel options are user focused, economically supported, and uh, ecologically sensitive. So uh, you'll hear a little bit from uh, Mr. Murray in, in uh, just a couple minutes. And uh, Dan uh, Palmy is um, the Director of Freight and Logistics Division uh, in Tennessee Department of Transportation, uh, which provides uh, leadership of issues of rail, water, and highway freight. Uh, the division serves as a liaison between uh, TDOT and freight stakeholders in uh, an effort to find opportunities to improve access to existing freight, uh, appropriately uh, prepare for the projected increases in freight as it moves in and out of uh, the state of Tennessee. Uh, the primary focus area for the division includes water, short line railroads, section uh, 130 rail program, and uh, rail inspection, highway freight and technology, freight advisory committees, and the freight and uh, state rail plan update. So um, as you can see, we have a great uh, set of panelists here um, and they have prepared a, a brief um, presentation for each of you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and start off uh, here with uh, the, it up here, uh, Mark Lochner's uh, presentation. Let him kind of give you a presentation 10 minutes. And then, um, and then I think uh, Dan also had a presentation. Then we'll go ahead and open it up to, and or I'll let BJ give his, uh, his comments and thoughts from uh, Illinois. And, and then we will uh, open it up to discussion and questions. Mark, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, James. I appreciate that. And thank you for the very nice introduction. And also the invitation to uh, attend the second summit of the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. I um, appreciate that and, and uh, been a good neighbor. Um, my buddy, Jeremy Edgeworth, I see is on and a lot of, from the uh, participation, I, I see a lot of folks that I know. So that gives me comfort that if I mess up in one way or another, um, they'll all give me just a little bit of slack and, and won't hold it over me too hard. Um, all right. so. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you can next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just kind of give a quick overview of some of the things that we have going on in the state of Ohio. And like a lot of state DOTs, we are in, deeply involved in the update to our statewide freight plan. And as required by US DOT, it's a um, required as part of the FAST Act. Each state DOT needs to have a, a a robust multimodal transportation plan to maintain freight dollars uh, for each DOT. Um, we call ours Transport Ohio um, for this update. And this is a brief slide to just kind of show an overview of all the different modes, including maritime as, um, and, and pipeline um, that we are working on in the state of Ohio to update that, that transportation plan. So we are very much um, um, you know, digging in deep on all of those modes to get a, a good understanding of how the state of Ohio fits in nationally and um, you know, each one of these modes and how they contribute to the, uh, to the economy. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. Um, so Ohio's maritime system, we have um, Great Lakes and the Ohio River. Um, actually more tonnage and more value uh, flows down the Ohio River than on the Great Lakes. And most people would think that big ships on the Great Lakes are carrying uh, large amounts of tonnage, but in the state of Ohio, um, the, the Ohio River actually uh, has a larger share of both tonnage and value than the, um, than the Great Lakes system. Um, we have 236 navigable miles between the um, Great Lakes and the Ohio River. Ohio River is 451.4, got to get that 0.4 in there, uh, navigable miles from Cincinnati and to the uh, border of Pittsburgh, or Pennsylvania rather. Um, of course, 97 um, ports and terminals um, are included as well on that. Okay, next slide. So just to give a quick overview of, of some of the things that we're working on as well when it comes to the Ohio River and our shared borders with our, with our good friends to the south there in Kentucky is that we have um, three, um, possibly a fourth um, port, um, navigable port authorities or statistical port districts um, with the Army Corps of Engineers as established. And a few years ago, and Kentucky was part of, part of that uh, effort, um, Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky expanded their, their port district from just Hamilton County to include both sides of the river and about 227 um, navigable miles of the Ohio River, um, making it at the time, number one, now sliding to number two, as the ports of Huntington Tri-State have uh, overtaken them slightly in tonnage. Um, both though are 17th and 18th nationally as far as how port districts are ranked by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we are in the process of creating, and I believe it's on the books, it just hasn't been officially announced yet, a new port district to fill the gap between Huntington Tri-State and the ports of Pittsburgh. It is a statistical geospatial area that the Army Corps of Engineers used to some tonnage value and other data and assign it to something, and that something would be the Mid Ohio Valley um, Port District um, that should be coming online here very soon within the next couple of weeks actually. And then of course the ports of Pittsburgh. Next slide. Um, so our maritime investment, a lot of people are interested in how is Ohio investing in the economic um, um, engine that the Ohio River is. And um, it absolutely is a very silent and workhorse um, that, that adds a lot of value to the state of Ohio and our economy. And we need to keep that vibrant. So a couple years ago with uh, Ohio Department of Transportation's biennial budget, we um, were gifted by the Ohio legislature $23 million to set up and establish a maritime assistance program for the state of Ohio. Uh, those funds were both for the Ohio River and the um, uh, Great Lakes ports and terminals. And some of the projects that we invested in were the Columbiana County Port Authority um, and within the Port Authority, there are private um, entities, S.H. Bell, Parsons Terminal, Wellsville Terminal. Those all uh, were awarded um, separate and distinct dollar amounts for improvements uh, to help their activities on the Ohio River. And then the Monroe County Port Authority just recently was awarded one and a half million for a three million dollar project. Um, the state of Ohio Department of um, Department of Administrative Services also kicked in with another 1.2 million, but at Powhatan 7 is what we're calling it, uh, that area along the riverfront. Um, we're gonna be doing some river cells and roadway work and, and uh, setting that uh, site up to better handle the uh, nexus between um, truck, rail, and also river freight. Next slide. All right, thank you. Another project that we're working on on the Ohio River is we are um, supporting and have uploaded uh, as of last Friday, the deadline, an MFR grant, which um, some of you may be familiar with, but USDOT has, a, has these large um, national grants that they roll out to the country and all jurisdictions, um, the governmental entities are allowed to apply. Um, as one of uh, the Department of Transportation's um, projects that we sponsored and, and have set forth was a project we called a logistics lane um, because it's a very freight related um, uh, grant program. And this logistics lane is a nexus between highway truck um, and the Ohio River by adding um, 
one element is to add additional AIS or automatic information systems um, uh, land side to the Ohio River so that uh, ship to shore, ship, they already have ship to ship, but ship to shore, um, barge to shore, I guess I should say, um, on the Ohio River, uh, better information in real time. Because what we want to do is we want to capture that and allow these uh, different relay stations and the ports and terminals to just like you have an Amazon Prime delivery um, to let you know how many stops um, that that barge is and uh, apparently when it's going to come into port uh, so you can uh, call your crews and have them on standby to, to get ready to receive that freight in a little more of an efficient way with the GIS systems on the boat. Um, we're also going to do some uh, roadway systems and then also integrate with our good friends in Cincinnati, Corba, um, Cincinnati, Ohio, or Central Ohio River Business Association um, has a chorus system, which is the Central Ohio River Information Systems, and it's electronic system that Corba has that OKI supports. Um, and we want to expand that to the rest of the river system so that we can have uh, better information based off that AIS system. So um, that's just one example of a, of a project that we have ongoing over in what we consider to be our Washington County, Ohio. Next slide. All right, thank you. And then again, how does the state of Ohio support ports and terminals and, and um, public port, port authorities and private ports and terminals is that we do a lot of different studies. And one of the studies that the, um, the uh, ports wanted us to do was an economic impact study of the Ohio River and how coal, specifically coal impacts uh, the economies and um, also general cargo and, and other commodities and the economies as far as jobs impacted uh, directly, indirectly, and, and the whole econometrics around Ohio River shipping. So we, we um, hired uh, Martin and Associates, which is a good uh, economic firm in uh, Pittsburgh area, and um, had them help us with, uh, with an economic impact study. We've also done a, a statewide maritime study and then strategy. Governor's office wanted us to to push into a strategy. We've also done Transport Ohio, which we're into now. And then we've done a series of other uh, reports and information to give the ports and terminals information so they can market themselves properly and also um, have the right information they need uh, to move forward. Next slide. And just um, almost last, my just about last slide, and then I'll wrap it up quick, is uh, these are some of the, the uh, industries that the Ohio River supports. And a lot of them are in um, our automobile industries, a lot of end users. We see the, a lot of bulk commodities traveling on the Ohio River, but those bulk commodities, once they come land side, um, go into business and industry and making actual products. And those products are a lot of the plastics industry. Eastern Ohio has the uh, shale gas and oil, um, which is booming right now. And those uh, petrochemicals go into a lot of different uh, things. And so steel making, um, you know, tires and rubber and the automobile industry, uh, there's just a lot more. I'm sure this is just a smattering. Next slide. And that's me. So thank you very much. Uh, just want to do a quick presentation, be mindful of my other two presenters, and uh, I'll be sticking around for questions if, if you'd like. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mark. I appreciate it. And that was very, uh, very helpful to, to kind of get the thought process flowing for questions uh, from this panel in just a minute. Um, I'm going to switch over to uh, Dan Palmy. If uh, you want to go ahead and get your video up, I'm trying to get the link to work here where I can. Okay, Jimmy. Share the, let me see if I can get your presentation up here. Absolutely. wanting to be a little bit silly with me, but I think I got it. All right. I'm Dan Palmy. I'm the, the freight, as Jimmy said, the freight guy or the freight man, Dan Dan, the freight man from Tennessee. Um, and so what Jimmy asked me to talk about was a little bit different. I'm going to do a little bit spin on there. And I know every, uh, I was unable to join the first session, but everything's been talking about ports um, in Kentucky. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, Jimmy asked me to speak on an actual rail program. And the reason 
is because we had a competitive program that actually leads to more business in the waterway. So I want to kind of briefly talk about that. Next slide, Jimmy. So a little bit of uh, just, I'm sure that everybody, everybody may or may not know, but the 1980 uh, deregulation did the Staggers Act, derailed, uh, deregulated the rail industry. And with that came about a thousand and five miles of uh, proposed abandonments in the rail site, in the rail market. Well, the, the legislature passed in 1987 to protect these 33 rural counties that the current short lines operate in Tennessee. The General Assembly dedicated some funds for both for aviation, railways, and water. Um, aviation, obviously, I'm not going to talk about. Water, uh, we participate, we pay the dues in the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway Development Authority, of which I'm, um, uh, I'm Governor Lee's representative in the state of Tennessee, and that's with our partners of Kentucky, Mississippi, and Alabama. So um, from a, a railroad, uh, historically, we had a rail rehabilitation program that was basically uh, set on percentages and dictated to the 21 different short lines in the, um, in the state of Tennessee and did a proportionment so they could be 286K compliant. So um, that was the history, but what I wanna talk about is a rail connectivity program that we, we did in uh, 2019. Next slide. So whereas the rail rehabilitation program was dedicated towards just uh, basically that rehabilita rehabilitating rail, the rail competitive program was a little bit different. Only railroad authorities could apply for the rail rehabilitation program. But in this connectivity program, uh, it could be different port authorities, get different government agencies, and the whole purpose, as you can read here, not to go into detail or insult you, was basically get jobs, enhance the marketability of industrial sites, and reduce highway and bridge maintenance costs, which several of the speakers have alluded to uh, in the conversation. Next slide, Jimmy. So if you look at what, what, did, the, uh, what did the program consist of? Well, it was $10.3 uh, million that we had uh, one time, and I'll go into the details of it very quickly. The maximum request was $2 million per applicant. It was required for those authorities or other governmental agencies to have it with a 10% match. But I want you to note um, this tight timeline that the state government did. This is, this is just incredibly tight. The application was 1015. You had to let us know within a month of your notice to intent. And it was due, it was due less than three weeks later in the award announcement. Well, why was that? Well, very simply is because the, the legislature was turning over. We had a new governor in there and the, uh, the old governor and the old commissioner kind of wanted to have a legacy to remember by. So that's what we, that's what we, uh, we did. You can kind of see the, the eligibility requirements of the different governmental agencies and some of the examples of different projects were spurs, sidings, truck, truck rail transload and river rail transload, which is really what the purpose of this, uh, of the presentation is. Next slide. So we had a total of 31 applications. There was a $36.7 million ask. That's not counting the local match. Some was uh, a total, some, some locals put in more, more than the 10% that, uh, that we were asking. And the projects re uh, really ranged from East Tennessee to, uh, to West Tennessee. So it really, covered uh, uh, all the parameters. Next slide, Jimmy. So here's, here's a list of the, the eight projects that were awarded, uh, awarded in Tennessee. The yellow highlighted are the ones that I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail. Um, and the reason being, if you, if you look at the project description on all these, it actually had a water component for all three of these. So I'll, I'll let you know uh, obviously, when I when I talked about that this was just awarded in 2019, realized that that, that it, it it took three months to award the project, but it took seven seven months just to get a contract um, a contract in the state to get uh, to get it uh, approved. Next slide. So I'm going to break down each of the different projects and where we stand uh, is kind of uh, to get your mind working if, the, if your state was going to do this or Kentucky wanted to do this. So the first applicant was the city of Memphis, Shelby County Port Commission that I'm going to go through. 4,900 feet of new track and four switches. 
to serve the Portland's customers on President's Island. Um, I don't know if you're real familiar with President's Island, but that is where most of the uh, port business is off the Mississippi River in, in Memphis, Tennessee. The total, total cost of the project was 1.9 million and uh, they were awarded 1.723 million. You know, there's, when we talk about the process and, and approving all these things, there's actually 27 different processes that we have in the state to go through. And so the current, the, the current timeline is it's just posted on the website um, for, the, uh, for the advertisement. I actually took a snapshot that sits there and shows. So if you're a contractor and you wanna bid on this, you have till uh, 413 to get your bid in. Uh, for the actual website, it's for the actual work itself. This is going to be a great connector because it's going to be a support yard for all the industry on President's Island. They can build trains there and then uh, deliver to the to the various shippers uh, that are located on the island or the the barge people that operate out of there. The next project, if you hit the forward on one, Jimmy is the Cheatham County. This is uh, located in the Nashville area. Those of you who may not know, Nashville's a booming town, even, even with COVID. I think we have still have over 100 people moving here a day uh, due to the cost of living and the, and the various things. The, there was actually a port in downtown Nashville. And if you all know your geography, the Cumberland River actually goes in between Nissan Stadium and downtown Honky Talks uh, on Broadway. And uh, this, this port was located right, right directly north of the Titan Stadium. Well, that's obviously very high, um, high dollar property. So they sold that. And so this Cheatham County was, was basically gonna be a, a offshoot of that. Cheatham County is a, a, a county over up on the Cumberland. So the logic was to take that business and go through uh, to serve that business out of there. The total cost of this project was 3.6 million. Obviously, we're limited to the 2 million max capacity. They applied for 2 million. Um, I'm not so sure this project's going to make. They had a lot of match that was in it, and the cost of the project is a lot higher, they think, than 3.6 million. The intent, the intent of my program is, if it doesn't make, I'll probably grab that money back and with some more dollars and try to do another round of funding in the future strictly for the connectivity grants and more economic development. The next slide's the last project I wanna talk about. Uh, oh, and by the way, first project was in Memphis, which is West Tennessee. Second project was in Nashville. Third project's near the Chattanooga area and, and the actual applicant was Marion County. You can kind of see it's a rail spur at an industrial port. And they look at this as gonna be the, the, the uh, the catapult that will really sell business to the Nickajack port. 3.5 million was the, the actual cost, 2 million in the state. Uh, the, the status is very similar to Shelby County and that it was a, this one was a little bit longer because to deal with the CSX, the development authority, the Marion County, the different mayors, the TDOT, it went back and forth. They are ready to advertise it. They want to do a little bit longer advertisement because they want to get more competitive offers because they think they're going to also exceed this 3.5. So they're going to, uh, if you look back on our website, we post all the bids and it will be uh, up on 4.1. So with that, um, that one should make, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm right at my 10 minutes and the next slide is my contact information if you have, want to ask me any questions uh, other than this form. But, Looking forward to hearing my friend BJ talk. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that, uh, that presentation of uh, some of your uh, intermodal programs where, where rail and uh, and the waterways were interacting and you were able to find a creative funding program for that. So that's very helpful to uh, those that are, are, are listening in and, um, would like to give uh, our, our last panelist a couple minutes to uh, to speak to you all and, and to give his perspective. Um, I'll uh, just uh, just go to straight uh, video here and then he will be able to uh, to reach out to you all. And, um, Jimmy, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm showing it's not responding right now. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. 
Just a second. You still on? I am on. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead yeah. and apologize. I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see myself, but uh, I don't know if you can see me or not. Go ahead. Oh, you want me to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. I'll oh, just, oh, uh, okay, okay. So yeah, my name is BJ Murray. I'm with the only Department of Transportation. I am the section chief of uh, aviation and marine program planning within the Bureau of Planning. I uh, thought I'd just give you a little history of where we are uh, today and, and how we got here. Uh, we are, in fact, the new kids on the block. Uh, we did not have a, uh, a ports and waterway section or a marine transportation section until really about 2017. There were some high level event water events and some low water level events where we saw increased freight uh, being moved from the waterways to the roads. And at that time, our Secretary of Transportation said, hey, we need to, we really need to get involved into the marine transportation. Uh, uh, so at that time, they were looking for volunteers and, uh, and, that, and that, that became me. So, so the first thing we did was we were in the process of updating our long range transportation plan. So the, for the first time in the history of IDOT, marine transportation was, uh, in, was added to the suite of of modes that, that were evaluated within that uh, transportation uh, within that plan. And then, you know, we, through that, we determined that we, we really didn't have a lot of information about our uh, marine transportation. So we decided that we would do a marine transportation system plan. So we, we went out through a planning services contract and ended up selecting WSP and EBP and then the sub consultants um, CPCS. And again, that was the first marine transportation system plan. And we included an economic impact analysis part of that to that study as well. And through that, um, I know in the bio, I think it mentioned 1,095 miles. We've actually increased that to 1,118 miles as a result of that. But we do have 19 public port districts. We have 27 locks. Uh, we have the uh, we have the Lake Michigan, we have the Illinois River, um, the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, and the Kaskaskia River, as well as what we call the Chicago Area Waterway System throughout the Chicago region. Um, through our uh, Marine Transportation System Plan, we did determine that there was a economic benefit of the, of the water Marine Transportation System of approximately 36 billion, and that it, it created about 167,000 jobs within Illinois. Um, within the system, we also have, uh, we have regular commercial navigation, but we also have water taxis, we have ferries, and even cruise ships. Uh, I think you mentioned that the Illinois International uh, Port District as well as the Waukegan Port District are only two deep draft port districts within the state. Uh, and so they do have uh, the larger uh, ships. So again, uh, as far as our marine transportation system plan, it was determined that it created 10.5 billion in worker income, 2.9 billion in federal and state and local taxes, and 17.3 billion in gross state products. Um, so once we did that, that was a piggyback to some funding. Um, fortunately, in, in the late in fiscal year 2019, our governor, uh, J.B. Prisker, and the legislature uh, passed a uh, $45 billion capital in investment program. And within that, there was $150 million that was dedicated to marine transportation or, for or ports. And so we have developed a uh, port capital investment program, and that's still uh, in, in the works. We've developed the guidance and the and the application, and we're really just simply waiting for approval to, to do a call for projects. Uh, as I said, that's, that's $150 million for uh, any of our 19 public port districts. And so it, it is not for private terminals unless they are uh, leased property or, or equipment or, or buildings on a, on a public port. So we took note from our 
Marine Transportation System Plan that um, the, the, the goals were safety, modal connectivity, state of good repair, uh, economic competitiveness, uh, mode shift, economic opportunity, and environmental sustainability. So again, we are anxiously waiting for approval for that to do the call for projects. Our, our Marine Transportation System Plan and Economic Impact Analysis Study is complete. Um, if you're interested in looking at the draft plan, it's out there on our IDOT website. If you go to uh, IDOT planning and then there's a Marine tab, you'll see the draft document as well as a, a, about a six or seven minute video that we produced outlining the uh, Marine Transportation System. Um, as I said, the, the final document is done, but because we haven't been allowed to release that, that is not yet up on the, uh, up on the website. So in addition to, to those, we, we did, when we did our competitive freight program, we did include $24 million worth of projects uh, at ports at the time, and those are, those are still ongoing. And then we most recently have awarded uh, or announced six port projects, uh, planning projects. And, and the way we're funding those is through our state planning uh, research funds. And so we've got projects uh, at a variety of different port districts um, for, again, port master plans and, and alike. Um, so those are, those are ongoing. And then we also have done through the, it's called the Illinois Center for Transportation and through the University of Illinois, we've done two research projects. One was a maritime freight data collection system and database to support performance measures and mark, market analysis study. And then we also have done a, a second one, which uh, was a beneficial use of dredge material from the Illinois Marine Transportation System. And with that is we, when we were doing the uh, marine transportation system plan, we kept hearing about you know the dredging and the dr and dredging issues and, and such. So, so we wanted to get involved in the marine in the beneficial use and try to identify uh, try to identify ways that IDOT could use some of this uh, beneficial use material as well as third party um, vendors as well. So, we're, we're really trying to uh, really partner with the core and try to help them identify uses of this material. They're running out of space to place the material. Uh, and so we thought that this would be a good opportunity for the DOT to help identify uh, uses of that material. So, so those, are, those are some of the things that, that we've got ongoing. We, um, we, we you know, our, our, our competitive freight program, uh, or I'm sorry, our, our competitive port uh, investment program is a kind of a one-time shot. We are hoping to keep that, uh, keep it, keep it going, and try to get a annual appropriation of, of funds so that we can further assist the marine transportation system within Illinois. Um, and as part of our Illinois Marine Transportation System Plan, there was programmatic recommendations in there, and the one was to establish a actual marine section. Uh, as I said, I'm kind of a volunteer position in that. And we uh, were anticipating maybe moving uh, an actual position under the freight guidance. And uh, hopefully we can uh, you know, staff that with uh, at least more than one person. So that is yet to be determined. But uh, those are some of the things that, that we've got going on at the uh, Illinois DOT and the, the state of Illinois. So with that, I will uh, call to close. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, BJ. I appreciate you giving that overview. Um, and, and we certainly are keeping a close eye on uh, your planning efforts in Maritime Arena in Illinois. Um, uh, really uh, impressed with some of the things that you've been able to put together. And I think it, it is a, a testament to uh, all these states in the, uh, in the, in the uh, hinterlands of the U.S. and the inland waterway systems that are striving to really elevate um, the river ports and the waterways, um, the inland waterway systems. Um, so if you guys would take a minute to maybe put, uh, you know, Mark and Dan and VJ, if you put your cameras on and unmute yourselves, um, we're going to kind of do this like a panel and just let you all answer the questions. Uh, some of them might be specific, but uh, some of them will, will just uh, be more general and we can let all three of you answer 
Um, but we did have a couple questions uh, that, that came about in the chat. I'll, I'll get to those first. And if anybody uh, that is on the, the session would like to ask a question, just turn on your camera um, and unmute yourself and we will uh, make sure that you can just directly ask your question in the next over the next couple of minutes. So uh, just starting off, uh, Dan, um, if uh, this is a question that was uh, in, in the chat. It says, Dan, if the rail project is not finished according to your contract, um, is the DOT then on the hook to pay back any funds? Um, it, uh, so I guess there's a you know, process of how it was set up. Yeah, so the timeline that we have on the grants is five years. Uh, obviously, that was in uh, the actual contract wasn't good to 2019. So literally, they have to June of 2024 to finish. Um, of the eight projects that I listed there, um, one is completely done already. The uh, three others are in the contract and advertised bid. So I think that all, all of those will make. We'll probably have two that have shifted once the tariffs uh, from uh, President Trump. It was an international company they're probably gonna put on hold. Um, two more will not. So at some point, probably in 2023, I'll make that decision and send certified and basically not allocate the dollars to them. We pay the invoices as they come in, so the state is not out of any dollars. The flip side is it does have a clawback provision, so we can uh, recoup our dollars if, say, um, that project that finished no business is ever brought in there. We can recoup that project if they were to, say, sell the property and, uh, and tear up the rail. Great so, question. Yeah, um, one, one uh, other question. Um, and this, I don't know who this was to, but uh, we'll just ask it and see. Um, it says, uh, will the, the Nickajack improvements support the uh, Volkswagen auto plant? Um, was that to Mark or was that to Dan? I think that came in when y'all were speaking. That would, that would have been to me. Um, okay. And no, uh, Nickajack ports a little bit this side of Chattanooga. They do have a lot of other rail improvements that are going uh, straight to Chattanooga Volkswagen. Obviously, we haven't even talked about that, but they've got an electric vehicle line that are that's coming coming online. So it's it shifted all the supply chain. But no, it's not going to have water delivery of of product in there, just rail and truck. Okay, and uh, Mark, just a question for you: uh, What agencies um, are supporting the ship to shore AIS system that you guys were? studying and, and uh, putting into place. I know it said you had some funding for uh, AIS and ship to shore. Yeah, so we are, yeah, we, so we submitted this in for grant, but we have a, a group of us that are uh, funding it. So DOT has the lion's share of, of funding in this, uh, both state and uh, federal. And then we also have the Ohio Rail Development Commission as part of it, because um, um, there's some rail improvements, safety grade um, improvements, and then also our safety um, section is kicking in some dollars for that one too. Um, might be the Monroe County, just a little bit to the um, north of it. Um, that one would be the Development Services Agency um, had a um, uh, industrial park loan uh, program that's a forgivable loan and, and they were in for 1.2 million on that property, that Powhatan 7, um, and then a 1.5 million from the uh, state of Ohio or me uh, through my program. And then the balance was um, through the port uh, system itself. So. Thank you. And this one is kind of an open to the entire panel. Um, maybe we'll start with BJ uh, since um, you, know, you just finished your study. You might have this, these numbers right off the top of your head, but it said, the question is, what is your state's large commodity, uh, largest commodity moved on the waterway system? Bulk, break bulk, general, et cetera. Sure, sure. By far, our, our, our outbound is food and food product. Uh, it's almost uh, 35,000 tons uh, uh, annually. And then the next one is, is, is still coal. And uh, coal prior to uh, 2017 was in fact the uh, number one outbound, uh, but as we've seen nationally, that the uh, coal has, has uh, taken a, a significant reduction. As far as uh, inbound for us is um, primarily metal products and it's 
it's really close between uh, metal products, uh, fertilizers, sand and gravel, construction, act, those type of things, and petroleum products. So those are, uh, those are both uh, inbound and outbound commodities that we see in Illinois. Mark or Dan, do you have any comments on your commodity movements by uh, Waterway? Sure. I, I was just going to say ours are, um, we're still um, deep in coal country. So there's still a lot of coal, uh, a lot of bulk and uh, break bulk that's being moved. Um, but I'd say our number two um, just became our number two is petrochemicals and chemicals. So it's the shale gas and oil, the fracking industry between Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, that whole region. Um, is just really um, exploding, um, you know, and, and those byproducts all broken down um, into different, um, different chemicals um, are feeding a lot of different industries and a lot of different types of uh, uh, products that, that come out of that. So that's probably our primary, primary stuff that's uh, rolling down, up and down the river right now. Yeah, and I, I think from a Tennessee perspective, I, I, the way that I understand it is, is petroleum uh, is a big thing. It's both the, the inbound and the expound, export. Um, Tennessee is very uh, different. The, the pipelines are actually almost at capacity that serve West Tennessee, that serve middle. It comes up through Atlanta, goes to Chattanooga and divvies up to Nashville and, and uh, Knoxville. That's at capacity. So we've seen huge growth in the petroleum industry uh, through the barge system. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I uh, had a, another question come up. It said, since earmarks may come back, um, are y'all considering any of these as uh, additional funding opportunities for either your ports or rail uh, infrastructure? I'll jump in there real quick. Um, you know, something I failed to mention when I was talking about our 150 million for our port capital investment program, a part of that $40 million was earmarked for the Cairo port terminal project, which is you know down there right there on the border of Kentucky. So, so uh, the state of Illinois is already starting to do earmarks and, and uh, as we see those nationally, we certainly look, like to take the opportunity for those if they do come back. Yeah, we were taking a look at it too in Ohio. Um, I do not have any specific earmark type projects on that. Um, you know, they kind of took them away and in lieu of, of these other massive grant uh, type competitive grant programs in the U.S. And now air, earmarks are, uh, are coming back, it, it appears. Um, we are developing a list. We haven't uh, shared it with our congressional delegation yet. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still trying to sort that, sort that out. But that's a good question. Yeah, and, and, and I would say probably uh, just as important as earmarks is, you know, infra grant. We just submitted three infra grants. My department actually did it for the state. Um, and, and, you know, probably build uh, may be coming up very shortly as well as Chrissy. And all, all of those, we will be submitting that. You know, any opportunity for all those grants really better benefits the state. In the case of last, last year, we actually submitted... Uh, with Kentucky trying to do an I-69 joint project that would, would help uh, the, uh, the eventual freight movement from Canada to Mexico that we're building now. Yeah, we did the same. We, we partnered up with, um, um, with our OKI, who um, our MPO in that region, and they sponsored some couple Chrissy grants as well. And we supported those uh, for New Core Steel, which was technically uh, a Kentucky, uh, Kentucky steel operation uh, container on barge and, and other things, but it made sense for Ohio um, because it also supported some of the activities that Nucor had in Ohio. So yeah, definitely partnering up with our neighboring states is helpful. In, uh, while I uh, have the opportunity, is there anybody that wants to ask a question uh, live on video and, and in person or... Um, I, I have a couple more questions in the chat, but I'd be happy to let somebody just um, openly ask the panel a question if they have one. Um, just turn on your video and, and unmute yourself and we'll let you go. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody uh, takes that opportunity, um, 
two two more questions to the panel. Um, which blue water uh, ports um, do you do? You, does your state have the most rail traffic uh, going to? If you're able to answer that question, um, sure, I'll take the first stab of it. Um, so Tennessee's very blessed. You know, Memphis Memphis serves five class ones. Uh, UP and BNSF have multiple. You know, it's kind of interesting. West Coast LA, Long Beach, kind of probably UP, Portland, Seattle, probably BNSF, uh, Prince Rupert, CN that comes on, all of them come to the to Memphis as the furthest east point, basically. Uh, then the Norfolk Southern CSX service of uh, uh, Savannah does a ton. Kind of very interesting when people, a uh, very interesting model with the Georgia Ports Authority has done, and they've actually opened up uh, Chatsworth, Georgia, which basically loads right on the port on rail goes about, uh, as the crow flies, about six miles from the Tennessee border, kind of near Chattanooga. So that kind of serves the, the eastern half or middle Tennessee, if you think of it that way. Um, and then Charleston also is another big, big point for, for delivery to, uh, to Tennessee, East Tennessee. So a lot of the major ports that already have the, the intermodal container transfer facilities or, or, or uh, off port facilities, that can service those containers you're saying or the ones yes. that are coming in? Yes. And do you have any outbound that you can describe as far as um, the bulk products that are going, that would be going out instead of using the waterway system? You know, so, some of my, I always laugh. I used to be an intermodal trucker and uh, believe it or not, um, we used to have a lot of business going to Murray, Kentucky. And since this is a Kentucky summit, uh, we would bring the, 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 uh, forget. Mattel toys the big wheels in and they bring about a hundred containers to every every one and they basically put a stamp on it in Murray, Kentucky that said assembled in the USA. Uh, so so it was a little bit of a product going out and product coming in, but uh, a wide variety, wide variety of products, mostly mostly imports, obviously, than exports. Yeah, I was just gonna say in Ohio, um, most of our deep water ports are going to be on east coast um, we you know we're kind of a jump ball between east and west coast but primarily a lot of our rail services the east coast so um, jacksonville norfolk southern every day um, once or twice a day has what they call the orange train and it's a tropicana orange juice that comes up from jacksonville and uh, goes into queen's gate yard in cincinnati um, downtown so that's a that's a pretty regular um, occurrence and then our intermodal facility our large intermodal Rickenbacker um, out just south of Columbus uh, in the center of the state um, has the Heartland corridor and double stack all the way to Norfolk Virginia so we have runs every 22 hours uh, you can get to the east coast uh, with container runs um, to and from Columbus Ohio to, to uh, Norfolk Virginia and then CSX built a big intermodal yard to the north of Columbus. Um, and it runs again, double stack. It's the gateway, US gateway project, um, all the way to the port of Baltimore. Um, and so pretty much Baltimore, New York, New Jersey, um, some, um, a big chunk goes to Norfolk, Virginia, and then a little bit Jacksonville. And then of course we have Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, a little bit on the north coast, um, up around, um, you know, the ports of Cleveland and Toledo that that run Canada bound, um, but for the most part, it's east coast. Thank you, Mark. Um, BJ, did you want to comment on that yeah, question? Yeah, Mark? yeah. We've only got uh, we've only got two really deep water ports. That's the Waukegan Port District and the uh, and the Illinois International Port District, both of which are on uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, the the uh, really, Waukegan doesn't have a whole lot of tonnage, uh, but the Illinois International Port District does. It's it's served by uh, each of the six Class One railroads, and then obviously it's got the uh, interstate system in the south side of Chicago. So um, I don't, you know, I would say that the port district is is, is kind of rebuilding. Uh, we're trying to put as much money as we can to that port and try to get it to utilize uh, more efficiently. But uh, it does have all the all the key. Um, infrastructure uh, components, the rail, the highway, and obviously water and, and, and even air. So, so um, uh, yeah, so 
uh, they're sitting in a good position. You just need to find money and, and try to rebuild that uh, particular fort, make it you better better utilized. Thank you, VJ. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left. I have one last question. It's going to be um, to each of you just briefly. But what do you see are the biggest challenges to um, moving uh, commodities onto the river uh, for, for your, your state's river port systems? Um, and what are the biggest opportunities to, to do that as, as you see them? Just, just the biggest challenges or, or the largest challenge and the, and the biggest opportunity uh, for moving uh, goods onto, the, onto your uh, state's waterway system. Um, okay, I'll jump in. I, I would say uh, reliability. Um, for us, you know, we've got 27 lock and dams and with the age of the, the infrastructure uh, and uh, you know, unscheduled and scheduled outages, uh, simply, I think a lot, of, a lot of companies will not commit to using the waterways because it's just not very reliable at this point. Um, but on the other hand, with with uh, container on barge, starting to see some movement in that direction. Uh, America Central Port down in Granite City, the St. Louis area, is doing some container on barge uh, operations. So uh, I, I can I, at least I see that to continue to grow and and develop new markets for container on barge. So um, yeah, it's just. It's, a, it's a still an underutilized uh, a mode, and we just hope to continue to keep the momentum going and, and, and try to find new markets. Yeah, we're kind of the same way in Ohio. We, um, you know, coal is still king, but it's trending downward. Um, you know, that's nothing's going to stop that trend. Um, but general cargo is taking its place. So the ports and terminals aren't just sitting around waiting to die. They're getting very active and, and getting um, getting a lot of different types of cargos that are moving in. And of course, the shale gas and oil um, industry has really um, blossomed and helped bring in a lot of that general cargo because they need that construction equipment to build those well pads um, and then you know feed those those activities. And then uh, third, absolutely, like BJ mentioned, the uh, container on barge is is definitely something we've been looking at. Um, um, we, I commissioned a report back in 2010 um, on container on barge, and it's continually um, looked at and examined. Uh, there's some a lot of interest in the Cincinnati um, area for sure um, on container and barge, and even repositioning empties containers, uh, trying to bring them up from St. Louis and other um, points uh, to try to shuttle those those empty containers around. We actually are a little starved in Ohio for empty containers because we have more, we're more of an outbound state than an inbound. So we export more than we inbound. And some of the companies are really looking for empty containers. It's, it's that's becoming a real imbalance uh, nationally right now. Yeah, I'm gonna give a little different perspective. Uh, you know, we're, we're very blessed as the previous uh, session, you know, talked about the two locks that are next to be fixed or is it the Kentucky lock, which feeds uh, Tennessee, and then the Chickamauga lock that feeds Tennessee as well. And the Chicks lock's been worried that any day now it could, it could uh, you know, basically implode. So it's critical to us, but I think there's a lot more opportunities from economic development and different things. Um, it, the, the next thing too is that, you know, there's already some uh, containers moving on barge out of Memphis. It comes internationally to, to, you know, from China to the West Coast, railed to Memphis, product delivered, goes empty down to Baton Rouge, where it gets on a barge to go to a bigger vessel to go all the way back to China. So it's, it's all loaded except for that Memphis to uh, Baton Rouge uh, leg, but it, it works on barge. So uh, I, I, I'm really positive, and especially the growth in the petroleum that I talked about, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's quadruple growth. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities as we move forward. Very good. Um, I appreciate this panel. Um, very insightful uh, and, and very uh, relevant to what's going on uh, with your sister state here in Kentucky. And, and um, um, you know, just the, the information that you guys have shared and the willingness to be, uh, be friendly neighbors. Um, is welcomed and uh, 
And I, I believe each of you shared your contact information. Um, just a quick reminder, these videos, uh, presentations and panels have been recorded. So we will be, uh, you know, you will have access to them later and we will have the contact information. And I'm sure uh, each of them would be willing to speak with you if you had any additional questions or, or ideas uh, that might be helpful to what we're trying to do here in, in uh, Kentucky. So again, thank you uh, to, to Mark, um, Lochner, uh, BJ Murray, Dan Palmy, um, very good uh, presentations and, and uh, question and answer session. And um, we uh, wish you all the best. And again, thank you, everybody. Um, this wraps up our final session for today. Um, again, I know we had a little trouble this morning with the, 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 the link. So if you're attending our sessions for tomorrow, um, make sure that you, uh, Make sure that you have uh, the new link that was uh, emailed out to you by Haley uh, so that you can sign tomorrow. And just a quick reminder, um, we're going to have the, uh, the forecasting uh, for future of Kentucky's freight and economy. Um, we're going to have how will the future of, uh, of freight impact other modal operations. And uh, we're going to talk a, a little about our infrastructure needs and Kentucky's funding uh, in those uh, those three sessions tomorrow. So um, hope everybody was able to find uh, some insightful uh, comments and questions and, and presentations today. We thank you for your participation and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. That thank being you. said, have a great afternoon. Everybody be safe. Yep, thank you. Thank you all.